It is? Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Titus. Good evening, everyone. Uh, could you turn, turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2? Second chapter. I can't say it now. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to uh, start in on uh, our study, the verse by verse study of this particular epistle, Paul's second epistle to Timothy. Uh, we wrapped up uh, last evening our study of the introduction, which we talked about who was the author of this epistle and the recipients of this epistle and uh, uh, where the author was when he wrote this and uh, who uh, the person who received it, people who received this particular epistle, where they were located, and also the reason why it was written, the reasons why it was written was in the plural. And uh, we just did a little bit of the historical context uh, in which this uh, epistle is found. That's one of the big things when you s interpret the Bible. Uh, you always interpret it in its historical context. And uh, we uh, talked about the literary genre, what type, uh, what type of uh, epistle this is, what type of a letter this is, which is also very important in relation to interpreting it. So uh, we, now that that is, and we had an overview last night, we went through the epistle in one evening. It's only four chapters and we went through an overview, a general outline, broad overview of what this epistle is all about and saw the, the structure of the epistle. And then uh, now starting this evening, we're going to go uh, verse by verse, and we'll be noting verse 1 here this evening. And there's a lot of things in the salutation. Verses 1 and 2, as we saw last evening, are what we call the salutation, the introduction to the letter. And uh, this takes place in Paul's letters, usually before the body of the letter, obviously. And uh, some, some of the letters that you see in the New Testament, like 1 John, don't have a salutation at all. Uh, but in this salutation, you have the author uh, presents himself as the, uh, uh, Paul presented himself as the author of this epistle. And he identifies who he's writing to. And then uh, what we're going to see here this evening in verse 1 is Paul identifies himself not only as the author of this epistle, but he actually describes his position and purpose in life. And that's very important. If you're going to do God's will, you need to know what God has made you to be and what uh, gift you have and uh, what is your purpose in life. So Paul knew that. And if you know what your, the game plan is for your life, uh, it's easier to execute it if you know what it is. If you don't know what it is, uh, you're, you're going to be in trouble. So that's why we uh, make it a net point of emphasis here to study what the Bible says and, and what God is, God's plan is for our lives. So that is our subject here this evening. We've got a lot of ground to cover. There's a lot of stuff in this verse I want to show you about Paul and uh, his apostleship and uh, his position as an apostle. And, uh, and then, remember, we have our on Thursday evenings after class, we have our prayer meeting. So uh, everyone is invited, including you, Cheyenne. <laughs> I have to pick on you tonight. So anyways, uh, with that being said, now, now we have to confess our sins in case you get out of fellowship. <laughs> oh, poor Cheyenne. Are you smiling? No? Are you mad at me? Now, I can tell she's faking it right there. See, she's like this. And when she's faking it, she's, see, she's going like this. So you can't, so you can't see that she's smiling. <laughs> I know you too well. Look at her. You're obviously smiling. Come on. Let me see. Let me see. Come on. You're so obvious, Cheyenne. It's... You always know when Cheyenne is, is like faking like she's mad at you, she'll go like this. And then he does the same thing. He's like, he can't, he can't play poker. Neither one of them can play poker. Too honest. That's good. You never can be too honest. That's a good thing. All right, let's, uh, let's uh, prepare ourselves with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day, another day to study the Bible, to learn of your plan. Uh, we just thank you for the things that we've been learning about our union and identification with your Son, Jesus Christ, and uh, we thank you for giving us the victory over sin and Satan. We pray that you would help us, remind us always through the ministry of the Spirit to appropriate by faith our position in Christ and consider ourselves as dead to the sin, night, sin nature and alive to you because we know that your word says that we've died with your son and been, we've been raised to new life, eternal life, through our identification with your son. Uh, help us, Father, to view ourselves as you look at us, not according to our sins and transgressions, but according, according to who we are in Christ, our marriage to your son, Jesus Christ. 
and help us to get uh, uh, have our identity come from that position in Christ, our relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to see that you have a purpose for each one of our lives and that you love us. And uh, no matter how difficult it might get in life for us, that you're always there with it, with with us. You'll never leave us or forsake us, as your word states. Uh, we thank you for everyone that is here in the Thompson home, and also those who might be viewing or listening to this class live right now through the website, or at a later date through the recordings on the website. And we just thank you for each person. We pray, Father, that you would, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, help each person to understand what is being taught, help them to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction, and help them to see. Uh, to consider what they're learning and then to put it into practice, uh, help them after class to meditate upon the things that they they are learning in this class and uh, in prayerful study of your word. Uh, we just pray, Father, that you would help me, to empower me to communicate accurately your word and with reverence and respect and power, help me to minister to your people uh, through the, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that as a result of this class, we'd all continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it is in his name we pray. Amen. It says in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm reading from the New American Standard at this point, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, and then he says, grace, mercy, and peace, from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. That's, those two verses uh, contain what we would call the salutation or the introduction to this particular epistle. Now, as we saw in our introduction, when we look at this epistle, uh, the circumstances uh, surrounding it when Paul wrote this. Uh, it was wrote, uh, written during the reign of Nero, who was one of the worst uh, emperors in all of Rome's history. Uh, he actually ordered the execution not only of Paul, and 67, 68 AD, prior to his death himself, but he also ordered the execution of the Apostle Peter. So it was during these circumstances that Paul wrote this epistle. It was during his second Roman imprisonment. Uh, he had two, one between 60 and 62 AD, when he wrote uh, Philippians, Philemon, Ephesians, and Colossians. But then he was released, and for about five years, four or five years, uh, he was uh, free, and he actually made a trip to Spain, according to uh, what he uh, said in Romans uh, 15, uh, he also probably, uh, church history says he, he did make that trip to Spain uh, via Rome, and, and so uh, when he came back from that uh, missionary journey, uh, he was arrested. He was, more than likely it appears from this epistle, Second Timothy, that he was arrested in a place called Troas, and uh, he was uh, arrested by the Roman authorities uh, probably under the orders of uh, Nero. And at that time, Nero had uh, set fire to the city. He had some of the uh, the real, uh, the, the vagrants in the city, the d people, the uh, low lives in the city. He had them set fire to the city because he had a, a great design of rebuilding Rome according to Greek, uh, uh, Greek architecture. And he fancied himself as a great uh, artist himself. And so uh, he, um, as a result of this fire, what he did is they blamed it, he blamed it on the Christians and they were considered as pagans in Ro Roman society, the Christians, because they didn't worship uh, the uh, they didn't worship the pantheon of gods in the Roman world or Greek world. And so, uh, his uh, uh, according to his Tacitus, the Roman historian Suetonius, another Roman historian who did biographies of the emperors of Rome, uh, these two men who were not friends of Christianity said the people of Rome were actually feeling bad for the Christians because Nero had blamed them for this great fire and this conflagration that uh, uh, enveloped the city. And so he is, uh, uh, Paul was probably arrested during this, it looks like during this persecution. We don't know what the charges were that were brought up against Paul, but that's really not, it's not important. But what's important to know is what the circumstances and the adversity that Paul was having under this situation. Timothy was in Ephesus, and so he would probably have to travel by ship uh, probably about 831, 100, 850 miles, maybe around 900 miles approximately from Ephesus to Rome, and he had to go by way of sea, uh, by ship. So uh, that was going to be a difficult journey for uh, Titus, uh, for Timothy, excuse me. Titus was in Crete as we studied in, in Paul's epistle to Titus. So it was during this time, around 67, 68 AD, that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote this final epistle to his great friend, his disciple, and a delegate in Ephesus, 
uh, Timothy, who was a great, great man of God himself. So this is the circumstances surrounding the epistle, but briefly by way of review. So Paul identifies himself according to the uh, letter writing in the ancient world in Paul's day. This is what they would do. They would identify themselves first. Usually when we write letters in America, in America here today, no, nobody really writes letters anymore. Does anybody write letters anymore? You do, Jody. You're one of the few people who probably do. And uh, they sign their name at the end. So uh, in, 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 in Greek letter writing or in, in Rome, Greco-Roman literature, the, the author would always put his name first. So Paul mentions himself here. Now remember, Paul, if you look at Acts, uh, he is also called Saul. Saul was actually his Jewish name. That's what he was. He used that name in relation to the Jews as Jewish countrymen. And then there was the name Paulus, which is the word translated Paul here. And Paulus was his Gentile name. The word actually means little. So he would use this name because he was what we call apostle to the Gentiles, as we'll note here this evening. So he would use that name that would be recognizable to the Gentiles, this name Paulus. So he used that rather than Saul. When he was with the Jews, uh, he'd use the, Saul, the name Saul. But when he was with the Gentiles, he would use the word Paul more often than not, because that was his a name that a Gentile name. So he uses this name here in 2 Timothy 1.1 1, 1, because the Lord Jesus Christ authorized him to be uh, the apostle to the Gentiles and the Ephesian church, which was primarily Gentile. And remember, Titus, uh, Timothy, when he received this letter, was in Ephesus. And remember, when we studied 1 Timothy, Paul left Timothy in Ephesus to take care of the, the church there. And so he was delegated authority to oversee the church there. Paul did, uh, gave it to Timothy, this authority. So here's Paul, and he, he is using his Gentile name because he's writing to Gen, a church that is primarily Gentile in Ephesus. And he, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ designated Paul as an apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, Peter was the uh, apostle to the circumcision, Peter says, uh, Paul says, and, and he, uh, that means he's a, an apostle to, the, to the, uh, the, the Jews. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, Paul, uh, Peter never evangelized the Gentiles. Acts 10 says he did. Uh, that doesn't mean that Paul, because he calls himself an apostle of the Gentiles, never evangelized the Jews, because if you read the book of Acts and you read Romans uh, and other uh, things that Paul says in his epistles, he says the gospel is to be presented to the Jew first and then to the Gentile because salvation is of the Jews. They have, the Jews have priority. So we see here that, the, and then they were to go to the Gentiles. Even Jesus said this in the, in the, is, uh, in the gospels. So here's the apostle Paul. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, Paul gives us a little biographical sketch of himself uh, in 1 Timothy and also in Philippians chapter 3. Uh, get, which gives us an insight into this man prior to becoming a Christian. And, of course, his conversion experience was, is, is uh, recorded for us in the book of Acts, in Acts chapters uh, 7, 8, and 9. So uh, if you could uh, uh, hold your place and um, go to 1 Timothy. Actually, no, uh, don't go to 1 Timothy yet. Go to, if you can hold your place in 1 Timothy if you want, but go to Philippians chapter 3 first. Philippians chapter 3. I want to give you a little quick uh, biographical sketch of the Apostle Paul prior to becoming a Christian. And it's not a pretty picture. Just going to show you that uh, God can save anybody. Hey, if he could save me, he could save anybody, right? <laughs> look, at, look at Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse 1. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Great epistle. I, I never finished this epistle when I was over at Prairie View. I, I think I broke that off to start um, to do Gen uh, first uh, John, which I'm going to do over, and Ephesians, which I'm going to do over. <laughs> and uh, then I did Genesis, and I, I like the way I did Genesis. I did over 300 hours in Genesis, but I'm going to do Ephesians and Philippians over again in First John. I, I didn't like the way I did them. I, and those, are two good, those books are great. I'm not gonna, I didn't do justice to them. And uh, that's another story for another day. Look at Philippians 3, 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me. It's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Uh, that's speaking of the Judaizers. We know that because the word circumcision is used for the title for the Jews, and he calls them false Jews by using that expression, 
false circumcision. He's talking about the Judaizers. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although, and now the Judaizers, what, the reason why he's bringing this up because the Judaizers made a big deal about their, like we would say, the seminary they went to, their education. Uh, they were, had a rabbinical training. They, were, they had uh, you know, their degrees and everything, just like people have today. And they boasted about their, you know, their, uh, what they were as rabbis and whatnot and stuff. And Paul goes, and that they were Jews and they were Pharisees or rabbis. He goes on and says, I, I, I'm all that and more than these guys. And you don't listen to them because I'm superior to them in every way as far as my credentials as a Jew, but yet I don't consider these credentials as anything. They're meaningless uh, and because now I'm in union with Christ. So he says, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, my human nature, human ability, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circums and he wasn't being arrogant. This was true. He was the top celebrity in Judaism before he became a Christian. Circumcised the eighth day, just like every the law says you should. Jesus was circumcised the eighth day. Of the nation of Israel. And then he says, of the tribe of Benjamin. That was the great warrior tribe. A uh, Hebrew of Hebrews. He wasn't just he wasn't speaking Greek simply. He actually knew Hebrew. He came from Hebrew he was Hebrew speaking from Hebrew speaking parrots. That's what that means. As to the law, a Pharisee. That means he taught the law. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. You want to talk about zeal for the law? Oh, I much more. I, so much so that I persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. He's being sarcastic there, saying, in my eyes, I was perfect. You know, I was, I was, I was keeping the law. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. But notice his, his, uh, his background. He's given uh, the Philippians seven uh, pre-conversion credentials that he had in Judaism that now me are meaningless to him. He was circumcised the eighth day, so he was not a proselyte. That's why he mentions that. Uh, he was of the nation of Israel, and uh, he was of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the great warrior tribes, though it was the smallest tribe, it was the great warrior tribe in Israel. Uh, Hebrew-speaking Jew of Hebrew-speaking parents, most Jews, as a result of the dispersions to Babylon and whatnot in Persia, they no longer had the mother tongue. Most spoke Greek. Well, a lot of spoke, a lot of them, most of them spoke Greek at that point. Not Paul. Paul could do Hebrew and Greek. So he's saying, I'm, I'm pure all the way through. I mean, you talk about being a Jew and having credentials, I'm right on there. And he says, as to the law of Pharisee, he was a teacher of the word of God. He was a Pharisee. Who was a, he was, meaning he was a member of the group that hated, attacked Jesus and, went and uh, persecuted him. As to zeal, you want to talk about dedication to the cause of Judaism? A persecutor of the church. The greatest threat to, to, to Israel, according to the Pharisees, was Christianity. So he said, I fought Christianity. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Look at 1 Timothy now. You were in uh, 2 Timothy. Go back up one book to 1 Timothy. And look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. 1 Timothy 1, 12. We studied this book in detail. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy, because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost of all. Now, why did he say that about himself? Because he was the one leading the charge in his day to wipe out Christianity. He was going to expunge it from the earth. He was going to wipe it off the face of the earth. And he had his the whole, total approval from the Jewish Sanhedrin. So here he's saying, as I'm the worst you could be, and yet... God saved me, and he did this to give everybody an example that if Paul can be saved, anybody can be saved. And so this affected Paul. He always rem you always see it in his writings, talking about uh, his uh, background and what God did for him in saving him, even though he 
was opposing God, and but he did it ignorantly out of unbelief, as he says. So he says, yet for this reason, I found mercy so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. So that's our Apostle Paul for us, and that's what he was before he became a Christian. And of course, he became a Christian, and he immediately became, a, 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 when he got saved, as we see in Acts chapter 9, he was called by the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was designated and selected by Jesus Christ personally to be an apostle. And we'll talk about that, excuse me, later in the evening, a little bit, uh, well, actually, we'll talk about this now, and also a little bit later in the evening, his apostleship. Now, uh, when he says in 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, he says, Paul, and then he says, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Now, the word for apostles, apostle, excuse me, is the word ap apostolos. And this word is, uh, we have the word for Christ, which is Christos. And the word for Jesus is Jesus. Now, the word apostolos is used by Paul to describe himself, and it refers to the office of an apostle. Sometimes this word, it actually means someone who is sent by somebody who's in authority. Uh, and that's the meaning of the word. Sometimes it uh, means the one who's sent. It, uh, it doesn't always, in the New Testament, designate the office of apostle, which only 12 men had. And then 13, if you want to count Judas, but Paul replaced him. So, it's, uh, so you got to be careful in the context in which you see it. So when Paul uses it, he's using it of himself, and we're going to see why he used this uh, because it expresses his authority in the church. You could go no higher in the church. There was Jesus Christ, and then there was the apostles. And then, So after the apostles, you had the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So these guys were the, the authority in the church, and they started churches, and they could go to a church they didn't even start and tell people what to do because they had that authority. And, uh, of course, they had a servant's mentality. They, they, they taught, and they also taught by example and exemplified the Christian way of life. So they led by example, which is the perfect way to do it. So here he is. He's an apostle, he says. And when he uses this word apostle here, it, he uses it often in the salutation of, of his epistles. You see it in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. It's found in 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, as well as Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, and Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Colossians 1.1. 1, 1. However, it doesn't appear, it does not appear in 1 and 2 Thessalonians, nor is it found in Philippians or Philemon. And more than likely, well, Philippians, they knew who he was. They respected his authority. There was no need to talk about it. And Philemon also respected his authority. So he didn't really uh, pull, pull, uh, pull rank, so to speak. And First and Second Thessalonians appears to be the same deal. But why is he using it and these other epistles, well, more than likely, well, especially with, uh, especially when uh, Timothy is the recipient of this epistle, he respects Paul's authority. So why is he telling Timothy that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ? Because as we saw in the introduction, at the very end of the epistle, in the benediction, the final benediction, and your English translations don't show it. It says, "Grace be with all, with grace be with you." The word "you" is in the plural. He's talking about the Ephesian church. Altogether, which Timothy was delegated authority over by Paul. So uh, that's why he's using this. He's basically telling, uh, expressing his authority to the Ephesian church by using this word. Now, the word for Christ there, that would signify, it's used, of course, of Jesus of Nazareth, and it signifies that Jesus served the Father exclusively, and this was manifested by his execution of the Father's plan, salvation plan, which was accomplished through his substitutionary spiritual and physical deaths on the cross. So this word signifies that Jesus of Nazareth has been given authority by the Father to forgive sins, to give eternal life, and to rule over all of creation and every creature as a result of executing the Father's plan of salvation. This word also, because of the nature of this word, if you look back at the etymology of this word and the way it was used, and it speaks of something that is the, the root word. It talks about something that's smeared with oil. And remember, in the Old Testament, uh, the, ki the king of Israel was anointed with oil. Uh, this was something to signify in a symbolic way, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. So when you use this word Christos of Jesus of Nazareth, it's not only saying that he's the Messiah, the Savior of the world, but it's also talking about the fact that he was perpetually guided, empowered by the Holy Spirit during his first advent. And lastly, this word signifies that Jesus is the promised deliverer of the human race from the bondage of Satan, his cosmic system, 
and the old sin nature. Thus, he's the, this word signifies that he's the Messiah. Sometimes some translations translate the word the Messiah. Some just translate, most English translations, I believe, just translate the word Christ, and that's how I do it. So in 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, this word Christ functions in, in the Greek, the, the word Christos, functions as a possessive genitive, which is quite interesting. It indicates that when Paul states that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, he's actually acknowledging the fact that he's been redeemed by Jesus Christ from the slave market of sin and delivered from Satan's power and authority and is now possessed by him. So the word is in the possessor. It's a genitive of possession, meaning that Jesus Christ possesses Paul. And this is true of all of us because Jesus Christ redeemed all of us out of the slave market of sin, not just the church, but the entire human race. And a sinner walks out of the slave market of sin and, sates, and, and, uh, and imprisonment in the Satan's cosmic system through faith alone and Christ alone. So this word... Uh, is talking about the fact that Jesus Christ has redeemed the Apostle Paul uh, out of the slave market of sin. And then he says in 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul says not only that he's an apostle of Christ Jesus, but he's not gonna, now he's going to say, this is how I became an apostle, by the will of God. So this is saying, this phrase, by the will of God, is saying, I'm not an apostle because of human appointment. I was appointed by divine agency. Jesus Christ himself, in accordance to the will of the Father, he selected me. So the phrase, by the, will of the, uh, by the will of God, in the Greek we have the preposition dia, which is translated here correctly by, and the word for will there in the Greek is telema, and the word for God, of course, is theos. Now this, it's interesting, this same exact prepositional phrase is used by Paul quite a bit. You see it in Romans 15.32. You see it in 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. You see it in 2 Corinthians 1.1 1, 1, and 2 Corinthians 8.5, as well as Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 and Colossians 1.1. 1, 1. And it, that's significant. And it's saying, in each of those instances, God appointed me. I didn't appoint myself. I'm not self-appointed. And I wasn't appointed by the other apostles or any other man. I was selected by God himself. That's how I was appointed. In Acts 9, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, appointed Paul, selected him to be an apostle. And that wasn't true of Matthias, if you recall, in Acts chapter 1. They drew lots to select the replacement for Judas Iscariot, but Jesus Christ overruled that by, in, in chapter 9 by selecting Jesus Christ personally. Now, I'm going to show you that Matthias was not an apostle of Jesus Christ. It was Paul that replaced Judas and, the, and there's signs for an apostle that Paul had that Matthias never manifested. So five times, by the will of God, that, that prepositional phrase, five times this prepositional phrase is used by the apostle Paul with regards to being an apostle of Jesus Christ and the salutation of a letter to one of the churches. So, the, uh, so uh, let me show you this. Uh, look at uh, Romans 15. Hold your place. We'll see a couple, take a look at a couple of these things. Romans 15, please. Oh, actually, what did I say? Romans 15. No, I don't want Romans. Go, you're, you're in Romans. Go at the next book, 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. My brain failed to function at that point. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul called as an apostle of Christ, uh, Jesus Christ by the will of God. Then look at, uh, look at uh, 2 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Go to the very next book. Bless you. 2 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, divine appointment. That is, there's an, again, once again, we see that prepositional phrase. Uh, look at Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. You have 2 Corinthians, you have Galatians, then Ephesians. Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus, Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Again, by divine appointment, not by human appointment, divine appointment. So you get the message there. You get the point there of, of uh, this particular prepositional phrase uh, that when it's used, 
It's Paul saying, I'm an apostle by divine appointment, not by human appointment. So please go back to 2 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. So when the word, the will of God, the word uh, the w- uh, will, as uh, the word thelema, and this word is used by Paul in regards to being an apostle of Jesus Christ, and it actually, exp- the word thelema, will, it actually expresses the fact that he was an, Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of the Father. So this word, the lemur, is the object of the preposition dia, which is translated correctly here by, by, because it functions as a marker of personal intermediate agency. What does that indicate? Well, it's very important because it indicates that Jesus Christ selected Paul to be his apostle through the intermediate agency of the Father's will. So this, uh, the word uh, God there is Theos. It's referring to the Father and not the Son or the Holy Spirit. And why is that? Well, the Son is already mentioned in the prepositional phrase, Apostle of Christ Jesus. And the Spirit inspired Paul to write this epistle. And the Spirit always glorifies the Son and the Father. That's why you ever wonder why Paul never mentions the Spirit in the salutations or in the closing parts of the letter because the Spirit is the one inspiring him to write it and the Spirit's job is always to lift up the Father and the Son. That's why you don't see the Spirit there. And that's why God here is actually speaking of the Father, the first member of the Trinity. And then Paul says, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So that's his position in life. And now... We're going to have his purpose in life when it says according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. That last prepositional phrase, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, which ends the verse, has a little bit of interpreting. We have to do a little bit of interpretation here. Not too bad, but you'll you'll get it. uh, uh, It'll be a lot clearer once I'm done with it uh, when you you see what I, I point out to you. Now, the phrase according to the promise of life, the word for translated according to is the word kata. And it's, uh, then we have the word as its object, epangelia. And then the word zoe is the word for life. Speaking of eternal life, of course. Now, this word epangelia is the word that's translated uh, promise. And it refers actually to the Lord Jesus Christ's promise of experiencing eternal life during one's lifetime on earth, as well as throughout all of eternity. Remember, Jesus said, Believe in me and you shall have eternal life. So that's what this promise is referring to. It's referring to Jesus' promise of eternal life to all those who believe in him. So this word actually contains what we call the figure of metonymy, which is quite often in the biblical languages appearing. And it means that the promise of eternal life is actually put for the communication of this promise of eternal life. So therefore, what Paul is actually saying here is that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of the Father, for the express purpose of communicating the promise of eternal life, which is in the person of Christ Jesus. This word that's translated promise in 2 Timothy 1.1, epangelia, is the object of the preposition kata, as I pointed out. And kata actually uh, is, shouldn't be translated according to, but rather, because when they do that, they're actually uh, interpreting it as a marker of reference, which it often is a marker of reference. So that's one of its usage, semantic usages. But I think, uh, let's see, uh, let's see, it's, uh, the net Bible goes from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. And then they say, to further the promise of life in Christ Jesus. That's a lot better than according to. But actually, I would translate it as a marker of purpose, meaning for the purpose of. So meaning he's an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of the Father, and the purpose is for communicating the promise of eternal life. That's the idea here. So this word kata, translated according to, you should actually translate it for the purpose of, uh, because it's a marker of purpose, and that's, how do we know that? Well, if you compare the clause before it, apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and the phrase, the promise of eternal life, we see that if you compare those, Purpose fits good when you plug it in. That's how you do it. Not, so you plug in a, a, a usage of the word, it doesn't fit, you go to the next one and see if you can find an, uh, uh, if it, that would fit and make sense. Sometimes they, they, uh, sometimes they might both make sense, and you really have to and look at it, and, uh, and, and, and eventually you're able to narrow it down many times what the exact meaning is of the prepositional phrase. So it would indicate here that Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of the Father, for the purpose 
of communicating the, pr the promise of eternal life. So right here, we see for the promise of communicating life, uh, for, the pro for the purpose of communicating the promise of eternal life, is telling us Paul's purpose in life. And when you teach the word of God, whether you're talking to evangelizing the unsaved, or you're teaching the church, you're actually, you're actually communicating to them the promise of eternal life. Because when I'm teaching the Christians the, 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 the word of God and the Christian way of life, I'm explaining to you how you can live an eternal life now and not have to wait till the rapture of the church. So that's, that's the idea here. So Paul not only is talking about his purpose for... Uh, uh, evangelizing, I mean the pro, uh, you know, making, giving, uh, communicating the promise of eternal life to the unsaved, but he's also talking about communicating the promise of eternal life to the Christian that when they, when they appropriate by faith their position in Christ and consider themselves dead to the sin nature and alive to God, they're ex going to experience eternal life. And we're going to look at that at the end of the night this evening in Romans 6, which explains this perfectly, how the relationship of our union with Christ and experiencing eternal life, how they fit together. So the word for life there, of course, is speaking of eternal life, which is the life of God, and it's received as a gift by the sinner the moment they exercise faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. And after conversion, it's eternal life is experienced by the justified sinner. That's what we are as Christians. It's experienced by us through obedience to the teaching of the word of God. And then lastly, we have the prepositional phrase, in Christ Jesus. You see this prepositional phrase everywhere in Paul's writings. Um, it's talking about our union with Christ. Or if it's not explicitly talking about our union with Christ, it's somehow related to our union and identification with Christ. What do I mean by that? We're crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ. How did that happen? The moment we trusted in Jesus as our Savior at conversion. What happened then? The Holy Spirit, His power, the baptism of the Spirit, identified us with Christ. The word baptize in the New Testament, like in Romans 6, or 1 Corinthians 12, or Galatians 3, it speaks of being identified with Christ. It doesn't speak about water. It speaks about, that's the word baptizo. The figurative usage of the word, it means to be identified with something, with someone. And that's very important. So in Christ Jesus, uh, we have actually uh, the, the definite article uh, is there, which is not translated, but uh, you can translate it as a relative pronoun. It's a substantive, which is uh, basically turning into a noun this prepositional phrase. Then we have the preposition N translated in. The word, we have Christ is Christos, and Jesus is the word for Jesus. So this word Christos is appearing again. At this time, it's the object of the preposition N, and it's a marker of means. What does that mean? It indicates that Paul was chosen by Jesus Christ to, by the will of the Father to be an apostle for the purpose of communicating the promise of eternal life. And the promise of eternal life is by means of our union with Jesus Christ. So what he's saying with this prepositional phrase is that we experience eternal life by means of our union with Christ. And I'm going to show you again in Romans 6 how that is. And we've talked about it in the past in relation to the subject of sanctification, an extremely important subject. Uh, we have three, I think it's three hours we did on the subject. It's on our website, it's on YouTube. Google it, you'll find it up there. Very important subject. So here's our translation of 2 Timothy 1.1. From Paul, an apostle owned by Christ who is Jesus, by the will of God, for the purpose of communicating the promise of eternal life, which is by means of union with Christ who is Jesus. Now, as was the case in 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul's describing himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ here in 2 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Even though he's writing to, to a faithful disciple and dear friend, Timothy. Now, why does he do this? The reason he does this, because Timothy already respects his authority, that's clear. The reason he uses this word apostle here, is, as, he, as he does in 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, is because this letter if you remember in the introduction, is what we call a protreptic letter <laughs> and also a paraanetic para letter. Let me spell the word protreptic. P-R-O-T-R-E-P-T-I-C. Protreptic, it's, it's pronounced. The word paraanetic is P-A-R-A-E-N-E-T-I-C. Paraanetic. Now, what do these mean? Well, 
paraanetic is a type of letter written to exhort someone uh, to and to advise them and to, to for them to pursue a particular course of action in life and to discourage other particular courses of action. And uh, so again, we see that the we have here a paraanetic letter that speaks of Paul exhorting uh, Timothy and uh, advising him to pursue a particular course of life and discouraging to pursue other courses of action. So Paul is presenting himself to Timothy as his spiritual father to his beloved spiritual son and repeatedly warns Timothy of the models that he can imitate, namely himself, and then explains th this model to imitate with a series of spiritual axioms. So here in 2 Timothy, what Paul's doing is he presenting, he's presenting throughout this epistle spiritual truths, spiritual axioms to Timothy in an antithetical fashion using a refutation of the false teachers in order to present to Timothy actions which are to be avoided. What he does is he's comparing the false teachers and their conduct and teaching with the way Paul's supposed, or Timothy's supposed to act and how Paul's already acting or how Timothy should be acting and is acting. So here in 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul is describing, as I said before, his position in life. And that is, and that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, which refers to the unique and temporary spiritual gift which held maximum authority in the church and was sovereignly delegated by the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is telling us his position in life. As I said before in the introduction tonight, that's so important to know your position in life. What do I mean by that? You've got to know who you are, what's your relationship to God and Jesus Christ. You've got to know about your position in Christ, how God views you and what he's done for you and the asset, invisible assets he's given to you to do his will, the spirit and the word, and he wants you to know your gift. Uh, how do you know your spiritual gift? The, mo the more you grow up spiritually, the gift will be made known to you. In fact, it'll manifest itself to others. So when you know, you, this, you should know, if you've been walking with the Lord for uh, 10 years, you should know your spiritual gift by now. It's, and, and a lot of people don't because they don't want their spiritual gift because they want to be out in front and they got a big arrogance problem and they think that uh, they have some other gift and really they have another gift and the church gets hurt because they think more highly of themselves because everybody wants to be a pastor. Everybody wants to be, you know, so, uh, have a gift, uh, the gift of, uh, of uh, what do they call it, uh, leadership. Everybody wants to be the head honcho. Well, not everybody can be that. Uh, just like a football team, can't have 11 quarterbacks. Uh, they have to have linemen, you have to have receivers, running backs, there's one quarterback. So, you know, we, the, the, the court, like Tom Brady. Tom Brady, uh, you know, when you look at spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts are like assignments of position in the body of Christ. So, the Patriots have a quarterback, so do the uh, Seahawks, they have Russell Wilson, great quarterback, and but they're only as good as the, the linemen in front of them and the receivers who catch the ball and the, and the guys they hand off to. So everybody has to do their role. Everybody has to know who they are. So if Tom Brady decides he wants to be a lineman now, the Patriots are going to stink because he stinks as a lineman. If the lineman decides, like a stork, the center, decides he wants to be the quarterback, forget about it. They have no chance of winning because why? He's playing out of position. So... The thing is you need to understand is that your spiritual gift, if you walk, the big thing you need to do is grow in love. Love God and with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbors yourself. You do that, you will serve automatically. You need to focus on obeying what God's word says, come into Bible class, doing what you're doing, and you'll find yourself serving. It's just a natural outgrowth of fellowship with God. So your gift will manifest itself all you have to do is worry about first doing what you're supposed to do, learn and obey God's word. The gift will then manifest itself. So people spend too much time concentrating about what the gift is rather than just obeying God and his word, and the gift will manifest itself to others, and it'll also manifest itself to you. For instance, I didn't know my gift, and so people started saying stuff to me. I never had any clue. I would, you know, they're saying, I think early on it was like, I think I was in my uh, you know late twenties, and I said, like, "You know, you, you have the gift. To, I think you have the gift to pass the teacher." I was like, "Really? What? I, I had no clue. I wasn't even going to church at the time." 
any church. I wasn't even serving in a church. So, uh, so what happened was other people see it, you know, that have this spirit. And they, but uh, I didn't see it in, in myself early on, but now I became aware of that. So what happens is uh, Paul's right here, what he's doing. I say this because if Paul doesn't know he's an apostle, he ain't going to do God's will. If I don't know I'm a pastor, I'm not going to be able to do God's will. If you don't know you have the gift of helps or the gift of administration or gift of leadership or the gift of mercy, you're not going to be able to do God's will. You need to go and you got to know your position in life. You got to know who you are in Christ and operate in that, that your that position and that God has given to you in the in assignment of position in the body of Christ. So Paul, if, if he knew what God put him on the earth to do. You should know after a period of time, that what God has got you on this world in this world for, and it's not to have gain a lot of money, to gain a lot of, of approbation from people, to get on television, you know, to make a million bucks, to be loved by everybody, to have a million kids, and uh, or a husband or a wife, and all this stuff, all the blah blah blah, and the big salary. That's not why we're here. We're here to serve God and to serve each other. And Paul knew that. And Paul knew that. And he was an apostle, not so he could push people around, but so he could serve people. He understood the principle of spiritual leadership. It's servanthood. Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. Do the same. Serve others. That's what he taught in the Gospels. So the 12 men who were selected by Jesus Christ to the office of apostle were, first of all, Simon Peter. Then there was Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, Simon the Canaanite, James the son of Alphaeus, not the lesser, Thaddeus, also called Jude, and Saul of Tarsus, also known as Paul. Now remember, in Acts 126, Matthias was selected to be an apostle by lot to replace Judas Iscariot. However, this selection was not honored by God since he was not personally selected by the resurrected Christ as the other 11 men were, nor did he demonstrate any signed gifts. Now, we can also confirm that inter interpretation about Matthias because if you read Revelation, you see, you see the new Jerusalem and it talks about the 12 apostles. If Matthias was an apostle, there would be 13 pillars in the new Jerusalem with the apostles' names on it. And Matthias would be one of those names. But Matthias is not mentioned. There's not 13 apostles. There's 12. So that tells you what they did in Acts 1 was not by the will of God. They weren't, they, they, again, this was Peter jumping the gun. He was impetuous. And they didn't wait for God. God chose, the Lord chose Paul personally. If, if God, want, if the Lord Jesus Christ wanted to replace Judas Iscariot with Matthias, he would have came down like he did with Paul and said, this is my guy. But he didn't do that. So one of the requirements for holding the office of apostle was the experience of seeing the resurrected Christ as Paul had when he defended his ministry in 1 Corinthians 9, 1 and 2. Now another requirement for holding the office of, of apostle was that of possessing the sign gifts, such as healing, which Paul demonstrated he had many times during the course of his ministry, Acts 14.10, Acts 16.18, Acts 19.11, Acts 20 verse 10, Acts 28.8, he also demonstrated the sign gift of tongues, which is a sign to the Jews to evangelize unbelieving Jews. Uh, Paul, also, Paul also demonstrated that he possessed this gift. So he had the signs of an apostle, is what he mentions. So the, uh, this is very important uh, that we see this. Um, let me see if I can... Uh, find this for you where I want to go. Um, where's my, let me just check it real. For, look, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I think it is. He mentions this. I might be wrong here. Oh, that's not it. Yeah, well, if he says, if he says, uh, 
Oh, he talks about the signs of the apostles, and of course, I don't have it on me right now. <laughs> now, that doesn't matter. It's, it's in Corinthians somewhere, and I, can't, I didn't write it down. So we, I'll probably come to me a little later. So he has, so don't lose focus here. He's an apostle. He demonstrates it by the sign gifts, like the gift of healing, like the gift of tongues, So, which is a, speaking in a, another language that you were never trained in. You have the supernatural ability to do this. So it's a, he has this gift. Yep, go ahead, Tyler. Uh, I don't know if that's it. First Corinthians chapter 12, you said? Yeah, 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 but that's not the passage. That's not the passage. Good, good try, though. That's not the one I'm looking for, but we might probably... No, he says, I have the gift, don't I have the gift of, uh, don't I have the, the signs of an apostle? That's what he talks about. But uh, that, that's good, you're in, the, you're, you're in the right, you're on the right track. Now, so again, he, he, Matthias didn't have these sign gifts, okay? Paul did. That was manifesting the fact that Jesus Christ had, had selected him. What were those gifts for? They were like credit cards. It basically, this showed everybody he was speaking from God. Now, when he, he didn't have the gift of healing later in life, in fact, he says in 2 Timothy, he left, what, somebody sick somewhere, so he didn't have the gift of healing anymore. Why? Because his authority has already been established as an apostle. So the gift sign gifts were to establish them as speaking for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the office and spiritual gift of apostleship was not appointed until after the resurrection and session of Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 16. Now, the distribution of spiritual gifts was authorized by the Lord Jesus Christ as a result of his death, resurrection, ascension, and session. However, the actual appointment of the spiritual gift of apostleship was made by God the Holy Spirit according to 1 Corinthians 12, 11. So don't miss that. Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians 4, he gave gifts to men. Like in Ephesians 4, 11, he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastor teachers. But if you look at 1 Corinthians 12, 11, actually the Holy Spirit is the one who's actually doing the personal appointing of the gifts at the moment of our conversion. So that, doesn't, that makes sense because the Spirit carries out what the Son wants done. That's what they do. So Paul was personally commissioned by the resurrected Christ to be an apostle to the Gentiles. That's in Acts 9.15, Acts 22.21. Paul also mentions this personal, uh, commission, personal com uh, being personally commissioned by Jesus in Romans 11.13, in Romans 15.16, Galatians 1, 15-16, Galatians 2.2, 2, he mentions this personal appointment from Jesus, Galatians 2, 7 and 9, Ephesians 3, 1, and 1 Timothy 2, 7. So in 2 Timothy 1, 1, the Apostle Paul's reminding Timothy that he was an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, which means that in eternity past, the Father sovereignly chose Paul to be an apostle of his son, and thus his apostleship was based upon God's initiative and choice and not his or any human being. So when he says, I'm selected by God, by the will of God, he's saying it's by divine appointment, and it wasn't human appointment. I didn't select it for myself. I, don't have, I didn't assign this authority in the church to myself. No, it was given to me personally by Jesus Christ. Uh, hold your place. Look at Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Look at Galatians chapter 1 and look at verse 11. Galatians 1, 11. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus gave it to him personally. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries 
among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions, giving us more insight into his uh, pre-conversion days as a, as a chief persecutor of the church in Jude and the, the star in Judaism at that time. But when God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, before he was even con his body was conceived, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. And then he goes on and keeps on talking about his uh, time with Peter in, in Jerusalem. But notice he's in verse 15, the Father chose me from eternity past, and this, was manif this appointment was manifested in time when Jesus Christ knocked him off his high horse on the road to Damascus, and he became saved. So in second, you can go back to 2 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Still a, one more passage I want to get. And I promised you that early in the evening, and I'm going to get to that passage in Romans 6. So in 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul's reminding Timothy that the purpose for which he was chosen by the will of the Father to be an apostle of Jesus Christ was to communicate the promise of eternal life. At the moment of conversion, when the sinner experiences eternal life by exercising faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and after conversion, they can continue to experience this life through faith in the Word of God. So 2 Timothy 1.1 closes with Paul communicating to Timothy that eternal life is experienced by means of being in union with Jesus Christ. I gave you my translation of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Where did you put that, Tyler? You have that? Everybody have that in front of them? Where did you put Do you remember where you put it? Cheyenne, do you see it back there? Oh, you have them all? That's because Tyler left them over there. Ooh, look at him. Look at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. He just can't say, okay. You do that? You have that face same thing too? You have to deal with that every day? Just go, yes, sir. It's all right. It's all right. I'm giving you a hard time. I don't care. I'm just glad you found it. Look at 2 Timothy 1.1 1, 1 in my translation. From Paul, an apostle owned by Christ who is Jesus, by the will of God, for the purpose of communicating the promise of, of life, which is by means of union. So he says the, the promise of life, life, experiencing eternal life, is by means of union with the Christ who is Jesus. Now, why do I say the Christ who is Jesus? Because there were many people who claimed to be the Messiah in that day, and Jesus, that word Jesus, actually is a date of apposition, meaning it's clarifying who this Christ is. It's Jesus of Nazareth. So there's no, there's no mistaking who I'm talking about, is what Paul's doing here. So the sinner experiences eternal life the moment they exercise faith in Jesus Christ as Savior at their conversion, which results in the Holy Spirit placing the sinner in union with Jesus Christ. This is what happened at our conversion. And he, I, the Holy Spirit, at the moment of our conversion, identified us with Jesus in his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and session at the right hand of the Father. Now, after we get saved, or after being declared justified, or we could say after our conversion... When I say justification, I'm speaking of the moment we, of conversion. When I say conversion, I'm being specific when I use these words. I define it specifically. My words are chosen very specific. I'm talking about the moment you entered into the family of God. After this takes place, now what? Well, God wants us to experience eternal life. So after our conversion, the justified sinner, i.e. the Christian, experiences eternal life by appropriating, by faith, their position in Christ, which would involve considering oneself dead to the sin nature and alive to God. This is made explicit in Romans 6, which we're going to look at in a sec. Therefore, if one is in union with Jesus Christ, like we Christians are, and identify with him in his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and session at the right hand of the Father, then we're experiencing eternal life. Or if we appropriate by faith, that position in Christ. Yeah, we're going to experience eternal life. So let's go. One more passage. Go to Romans 6. I'll tell you what. If you want to know what the Christian way of life is all about, Romans 6 is where it's at. It's the most, it's the longest clear delineation of our position in Christ, our identification with him, and how it relates to the Christian way of life. So look at Romans 6.1. Romans 6.1. 
We're going to read the whole chapter here. Romans 6.1. What shall we say then? Paul used to do this. He'd, he'd take up the arguments of his opponents. He, he, listened to his, he, he listened to his enemies and their arguments, and then he used them in his writings to refute them. And so he says, what shall we say then? Because some people say, oh, you're teaching grace. See, the Jews would say, oh, Paul, you're saying get telling people they're not, they don't have to keep the law to get saved. Uh, well, aren't you telling people to, these people to be lawless? And then they're just like, you know, you're teaching these Gentiles that they can live all, any old way they want. And Paul's saying, no, you're not justified by keeping the law. You'd have to keep the law perfectly. So you'd have to have faith in Jesus because you're saved on his merits and his merits alone and what he did for you on the cross. And so now we can talk about works after you're into the family of God. You're saved for works, not on the basis of works. Let me repeat that. We're saved not on the basis of works, but for the purpose of performing good works. So that means we have to get saved first, get the gift of the Spirit, then we have the capacity to perform good works that are pleasing to God. We study that in Titus. If you can get that, you got a lot more than a lot of other Christians have today. Sadly, I hate to say that. But so Paul's opponents say, oh, you're, you're, telling, you're, telling great, you're telling us that grace is, you're giving grace as a license to sin. And that's, he says, no way. What should we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? It's by grace, Paul, so we could just live like hell, right? No. May it never be. You can't, in fact, when he says absolutely, when he says may it never be, I like absolutely never. By no means. He's emphatic. You can't, it's the strongest way in Greek to say something emphatically. No. <laughs> never. Okay? How shall, it, how shall we, who died to sin, still live in it? Wait, that's our identification with Christ in his death. That's retroactive positional truth. When Christ died, God says you died. How is that, how is that the case? Well, remember Romans 5, 12 through 21? There's, there's the whole, human race is shut up under two people, Adam and Christ, the last Adam. We were all in Adam prior to becoming Christians. Now that we're Christians, we're under the headship of Christ. We were condemned under Adam, but now we're blessed under Christ. So when Christ died, we're identified with Christ and those great events in his life that provided our so great salvation. We're identified with him in his crucifixion. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20. We've been died with Christ. We're buried with Christ, as he mentions in Romans 6. And we're raised and seated with Christ, as he says in Ephesians 2. That's how God views you. That's what he's done for you through the baptism of the Spirit. And that's how he wants you. He wants you to adopt that viewpoint of yourself. We'll see it here. He, so he says, or do you not know that all of us who've been baptized, that means identified with Christ Jesus, have been identified with his deaths? So when I use baptized there, I'm going to change it to be identified with. Because that's what the idea is, the word in the Greek is. It has nothing to do with water. I've been, so he says, don't you know, or do you not know, something you should know as a Christian, that all of us who've been identified with Christ have been identified with him in his death? Meaning, God looks at you and I as dead with Christ. This is why no one can say you have to keep the law. You know those Seventh-day Adventists? They wanted to keep you under the law. He said, I'm dead to the law. He said that in Romans 7, 1 through 6. If I've died to the law, I'm not under the law's authority. I've died with Christ. How can I be under the authority of the law anymore? I'm dead to it. I'm dead to the sin nature now. The sin nature can't condemn me. God can't condemn me because of my sin. Because I've died to it. That's the cross for you. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism, baptism of the Spirit, into death, Christ's death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk. That means live your life in newness of life. I think the Net Bible translates this phrase, new life. That's exactly the way she translate it. It means talking about eternal life. So you died with Christ, so God could raise you with Christ so that we could walk in eternal life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, in the Greek, the first class condition, it's the assumption of two for the sake of argument. To, it's an argumentation. It's the way you argue people and debate his technique. So he says, you could say, for if, and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument, we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, and the audience would agree because they've been taught this. And we have. Certainly then, we should also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That's the guarantee that we're all going to be raised from the dead. 
So then he says, knowing this, that our old self, our old way of living, the old nature, was crucified with Christ in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. So when, when you come to temptation for sin, you got to say to yourself, I've died with, you have to think, I've died with Christ, I'm dead to sin, why am I going to commit sin when I've died to sin? doesn't make any sense. God crucified me with Christ so that I wouldn't be sinning, so I don't have to sin anymore. I'm not a slave to sin anymore. I don't have to do that all the time. I can say no to it. Now, if we have died with him, and again, the Greek says we have, if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all, the whole human race. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Now look what he says. Even so, consider. Consider means adopt this view and act upon it. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin. Why? Because you died to sin through your union with Christ and being identified with him in his death. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Why do you have to consider yourself alive to God in Christ Jesus? Because that's who God made you to be. He raised you with Christ 2,000 years ago. That's how he views you and me. And this is how he wants us to act. Act according to who you are. You heard me use the analogy. If you're a, why would you want to dress like a bum, live like a bum, go to lousy, you know, don't go to, uh, you know, live as a hermit in your, uh, you know, get a little shack in the woods and shoot raccoon for supper or squirrels for supper when you're a, you're, you're a multi-million, billion dollar rich person, why would you live like that? I mean, you can, but really, you're not really living or acting as if, as who you really are. Well, let's put it this way. If you're a human being, why would you want to act like a cow? Or why would you want to act like a dog? Or, I don't know, a chipmunk? Or a squirrel? When you're a human... That's a little shot for those guys. They always call me squirrel or chipmunk. And I don't know why that is. Or teddy bear. You're not a teddy bear. You're a human being. That's who you... So why act something that you're not? Be who you are. If you're a girl... Why would you want to act like a boy? Oh, that's another can of worms being opened up there, huh? So in this day and age, what's that thing going on with that guy? Man, he used to be, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. So anyways, you act, God, God's saying, be who God made you to be. Therefore, based upon these things, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body your legs, your arms, your feet, your eyes, your tongue, your mouth, your nose, your ears. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to, as instruments uh, to sin, as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of God, of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? May it never be. Absolutely not. Do you not know? Again, you got to know something. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you're slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. He's personifying the sin nature. Then he says, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So you, prior to becoming a Christian, you were slave to unrighteousness, slave to sin, slave to the devil. Now that you're a Christian, you're no longer a slave. So why live as a slave to sin and a slave to the devil by committing acts of sin when that's not who you are anymore? Your identity, you have a new identity in Christ. Then he says, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Then verse 19, he says, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. 
Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? I mean, really, think about what we did prior to becoming a Christian. It's, you know, it, you're, we're ashamed of it. Do we ever derive any benefit? Did it ever do us any good sin? No. It made us miserable. For the outcome of these things is death. And now look what he says. I'm going to tie your, your position in Christ, your union with Christ, your identification with Christ, and his death and resurrection with experiencing eternal life. Look what he says. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. Sin pay, pays out de uh, death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal life is in our union and identification with Christ. In Christ Jesus, speaking of our, our union and identification with Christ in his death and resurrection. That, so what does that mean? You appropriate by faith your position in Christ. Like Paul says, consider yourself dead to the sin nature and alive to God, and you will experience eternal life. Be who God made you to be. He, he said, you die with Christ, and you're raised with Christ, and see with Christ. Operate accordingly. You got to think that. Think about it. That I don't want to sin here. I get this temptation to sin. I don't want to do that, because that's not who God made me be, to be. I've died to the sin nature. Why would I want to commit sin? I'm, I'm dead. God, that's who God made me to be. He made me to experience eternal life, not loss of fellowship. He, he, he saved us so we could have a relationship with him, eternal life. And eternal life is knowing the Father. Uh, one more passage. I, one more passage. Almost time here. Look at John 17.1. Eternal life for us is experiencing the Father. John 17.1. Hurry. We got to go to our prayer meeting. John 17, 1. John 17, 1. This is Jesus' great high priestly prayer. Jesus spoke these things, things he said in chapters 13, 14, and 15, and 16. And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. Meaning, I'm going to the cross. Even as you, and I'm going to be raised from the dead. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Look what he says. This is eternal life. What's that? That they may know you. Know means experientially. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What does it mean to know God the Father experientially? See, if he who knows the Father knows the Spirit too, because they're the Trinity. You experience eternal life and experience by having fellowship with the Father. That's eternal life, experiencing the Father. What does that mean? Personally encountering the Father so that it affects your, your, who you, uh, your priorities, your decision-making, everything. It it when you're having fellowship with the Father, it will rub off on you. If you hang around with somebody who is godly, or you're gonna, it's going to rub off. You hang around somebody who is, who is a, a, a criminal, you know, you, bad company corrupts good morals, right? So... Uh, he, we have fellowship with God when we obey his word. Well, let's go get specific. If we appropriate by faith our position in Christ and consider ourselves dead in the nature and alive to God, we're going to experience God, meaning we're going to personally encounter the Father. That's eternal life. It's not just uh, uh, no beginning and no end. It's a quality of life. It's a life of being with God and fellowshipping with God, walking with God. That's eternal life liking the things he likes, doing the things he likes to do. Uh, it's, it, that's what it's about. It's, it, it, it's not about, you know, the world's way of living. It's doing things in life the way God lived, uh, God likes to do. In other words, living according to his standards, and his standards are found in the word of God. Well, we ran out of time. Let's close in prayer, and then we'll have our prayer meeting. Father, thank you for this time to study your word. We pray this class would be a blessing to your people. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, give us a few minutes. We'll have our prayer meeting.